Well, funny you should ask that. Years ago, long time ago, I met this really old Nigerian woman, and she said all her ancestors had lived to over 100. And she was only about 30 when her tribe was discovered. You know, up until then, they were sort of on their own. And they were so far inland that they didn't know that oceans or seas or salt existed. And I said to her, I thought everybody needed salt to live. And she said, well, uh, what the tribe did was at the end of each meal, they put all the waste, the food waste on the fire. And the next day when it was down to white ash, they'd take a couple of spoonfuls of ash and put it in the next meal, mix it in. So they were just always recycling the minerals to the maximum. So I mean, ash, potash, yes, potassium. You know, potash is great for the plants, the flowers, and for us. So it's a bit like, as I was saying with the soil, that all life is there. Minerals are not destroyed by heat. So you can burn, you can burn it to the ground, and the ash is good for you. Are sanctions and a weaponized U.S. dollar prompting central banks to diversify with gold? As the U.S. imposed the harshest sanctions in history against Putin, the central banks of Saudi Arabia and China have taken notice. Saudi Arabia is considering accepting Chinese yuan for oil sales to China. Could this spell the end of the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency? Because since March 2020, gold's up 30%, silver's doubled. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo all forecast gold to surpass $2,000 an ounce. Call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Call 1-800-356-4470 for a free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer from 2016 to present, click on the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. And good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Clive DeCarl. Now, as we move through these transitions here into the fertilizer shortages and less foods being grown, the hyperinflationary push on foods where people are going to start making a lot different choices on what they eat, what they put in their bodies, how's that going to affect nutrient intake? Because over here on Clive's site, clivedecarl.com, quote, there are only three reasons that we lose our health, physical damage, toxicity, and nutrient deficiency. No fourth reason. So pinging on this nutrient deficiency as people make choices to buy foods that might cost less because you need something to fill your belly or we come to seasonal diets where things are just simply not available anymore. You're going to have to change your choice. And also when we grow foods, you know, what types of foods would you want to grow with high chlorophyll, vitamin C, different vitamins, proteins, micronutrients, as the food and the calories start to diminish, well, society does lockstep because everything's intertwined, but it's all about preparing and knowing what you need to keep your bodies functioning at optimum level. I'm just looking for ideas for others as well, because if you can only, let's say you only have enough money for two meals a day instead of three. I mean, you're going to want to get the most out of the nutrition that you can while you eat. So anything going down, down that direction, in addition to just strict digestion. So Clive, thanks for joining me. One of the favorite people I've interviewed over the years was Dr. Jennifer Daniels. And she tells two stories, uh, which I like to repeat. One of them is she gets a phone call and it's a family. Mom is in hospital and she's in a coma and she's going to die but they have to keep her alive for like eight days because if they do, the family inherits something like $700,000. So the task for Dr. Daniels is keep mum alive for at least eight days. So what can you do? Because in the hospital, they won't let you give them supplements or whatever, and she's in a coma anyway. So what she says is, look, get the best uh, organic vegetables you can get and simmer them for hours and hours and hours until they're a mush. 
strain the mush through muslin or cotton or something till you've got clear liquid, prop mum up in, a, in the bed in a coma, they still swallow, and half a teaspoonful or whatever you can get in of the broth, and mum lived another two years. That's mega nutrition for somebody who hasn't got the strength to digest. You're pre-digesting it by breaking it down into the smallest component ever. Then Jennifer herself, who'd been vegan for an incredibly long time, has got so weak she can't get out of bed. And her, her intuition kicks in and says calves liver. She has a maid. She lives in Panama, sends out for calves liver and is out of bed by the end of the afternoon. What was the deficiency so, on then? What, what was added back? Everything. In after... I mean, everything. I mean, I mean, vegans have got a really hard time because they run out of B12. Now, it could be years before they run out of B12. Clive, you have that Tesla device behind you because talking about frequencies, I mean, yeah, that's the same with anything. Good or bad is how are you going to use it? Electricity is good or bad, too. I could electrocute somebody or I can heat my home with it or I can you know, drive a motor and grind some grain into flour. Or at the same time, negative frequencies coming off of electrical devices, phones, smart meters, et cetera, compared to well, with what you have there in the background. Can you explain that Tesla device that, that we're looking at in the, in the top left of where, where you're sitting? Sure. Uh, Tesla in general has been written out of history. You know, he's becoming known a bit because of the car connection, but... Tesla was the greatest scientific genius from an electrical perspective ever. And 100 years ago, everybody would have known his name because of, you know, he lit, he lit the world you know, with his AC electricity and his Edison connection and so on. So, but what people don't know is while he patented everything he ever invented, uh, he didn't patent healing devices. And at the end of his life, uh, when, when he was near death, uh, one of his big regrets that he wrote about was not doing more with the healing devices, but he was so convinced that the world would accept wireless transmission of power that he felt that the healing devices could come later. Anyway, um, in the 1880s, he was uh, making uh, glass vacuum tubes filled with noble gases like argon and neon and so on. And what he'd noticed in the 1880s were the people coming to his lab with whatever ailment they might have within the massive high frequencies that he was generating, everybody seemed to come out of pain and problems just vanished. So by 1891, he was touring Europe and giving lectures about what he'd discovered. And a couple of particular scientists ran with it. And so by 1893, Tesla was showing uh, this sort of stuff at the Chicago World's Fair, you know, the Columbia World's Fair. And by the turn of the last century, they were becoming pretty popular devices. So dentists began to use them because you can get a few minutes anesthesia, maybe five minutes anesthesia with the cocaine electrode, enough time to quickly pull a tooth, perhaps. Uh, hairdressers were using them to restore hair and people were buying them to use at home, right? It was, you'd buy 1910 or something, your local pharmacy probably would have had one in the window because they were made at that point to run off AC or DC, high voltage or a battery. They, you, know, it, you lived on the farm and you were three days mule ride to the doctor, assuming you had a mule or you had a doctor, so, but if you had a battery, you could run this stuff. So, you know, 1843, 1843, it's almost 200 years ago, Guy's Hospital, one of the big hospitals in London, uh, had an electrotherapy department where they were treating people with, you know, battery technology, laden jar technology, uh, with incredible results. You know, so by the turn of the last century, electrotherapy was one of the more important departments in every hospital. But obviously, as Rockefeller Medicine took over, it was seen as a big threat. And various things happened. And so why is this technology written out of history? Well, 
the course of events was radio got invented and everybody wanted a radio. And this technology at this frequency, it's a long wave frequency, interfered with radios. So globally, the manufacturers uh, of the hospital type technologies switched to short wave. And at the same time, then valve technology was coming out. So they switched from the old original technology, which is resonating Tesla coils. Now, there are some people who say the cells of our body resemble resonating Tesla coils. They charge up and discharge. So these, these machines have two resonating Tesla coils and capacitors to charge up and discharge. And so radio comes out and the hospitals have to do away with all their equipment and they switch to valve technology and shortwave because they didn't realize that it's not the same. Tesla coils are very, very special. You know, basically two resonating Tesla coils, unlike Rife technology, where you dial up all the individual frequencies you want, these res resonate across the spectrum. You can change it slightly by using the different gases or whatever. Um, so then what happened was World War II. Now you can convert the big machines into very powerful radio transmitters and because they were worried about spies, they again stripped these machines out. Then after World War II, they stopped teaching it. Just gone from the, uh, from, you know, from the schools. However, surgeons still use them today. And that technology is called diathermy. And ophthalmologists love it. Various surgeons love it. Because if you cut with a scalpel it bleeds. If you cut with electricity, it cauterizes it, so there's no bleeding. So you don't want to bleed if you're doing an eye operation. So you, you, can, you can cut uh, without needing a scalpel. So that side of it is still known about and taught to doctors. But what the doctors aren't taught, that if you change it and turn the frequency right down and use it in a different way, you can heal rather than cut. So that's the bit that's been lost. So what happened to the machines? Well, uh, some 20 years ago, I was working with a medical doctor who told me about Tesla's machines. I had no idea. Nobody knows, virtually. And so I bought one. And the one I bought was you know, decades old. And it didn't have an instruction book, but it was fine because it only had one knob, had an on-off switch and a volume knob, you might say. So over the years... I've got to know everybody who repairs them because not every electrician knows how to deal with resonating Tesla coils. Um, so I've got a team of people now who search the world for them. Um, you know, I just bought one in India. Um, and then over the years, we've worked out which ones are worth restoring and which ones are just rubbish and not, you know, haven't stood the test of a hundred years, for instance, where others are just fantastic. Is the technology able to be replicated to build new oh, devices sure. versus yeah. finding old ones that have to be refurb? Yeah, yeah, no, it, there are two issues. There's the machines, anybody can wind a Tesla coil. That's not hard. That take, um, where it gets more difficult or more, in this, I mean, they're electromechanicals. So not only have you got frequency generators going on, but you've got little hundred year old moving parts and so it helps to know about that side side of it so building that easy it's the glass it's the glass back in the day where everybody blew glass filling vacuum tubes like neon sign makers you know that sort of thing if you wanted it super thin because the thinner the glass is the more effective it is um and finding glass blowers is next to impossible now there are three glass blowers who do this stuff left in the world. One is on the edge of retiring and the quality, it's nothing like the stuff in the twenties. Um, then there's another guy in Germany and well, basically the long story is none of them can blow glass properly. Now the Chinese are blowing glass and this is a piece of Chinese glassware, uh, but 
blindfolded, I can touch it and tell you that the glass quality isn't like the glass they used to use because a lot of the glass manufacturing now is illegal. You know, borosilicate glass, for instance, which is the type you can put directly on naked flame, they banned that years ago because of the, the pollution from the manufacturing process. So it's a combination of lack of skill. You know, I expect most of this is molded rather than blown. Yeah, it's the glass blowing side that's the tricky bit. And I mean, the two people I know are in their 70s. Uh, their children don't want to do it. And, you know, they just, it's who wants to become a glass blower these days? Apparently not. I mean, but again, the, because this technology has just faded out, um, you know, but uh, long term, uh, I would like to remake uh the machines from new but then you've got the regulations you see i mean all of these devices are 100 years old and working strong it's not ul approved clive you're not allowed to use it no exactly that's exactly. funny i tried to uh I, I found some solar powered flashlights when i was over traveling in asia and then as i was trying to leave asia with them they're like you can't take the flashlights with you i'm like well wait a minute i bought them in your country i'm going to no, they may maybe get my luggage off the rack and then open it up. And they're like, see, you're flying back to the United States. You can't take that back because it does, doesn't have a CE or, or UL approval on it. So you're not even allowed to export it out of the country, even though in their own native countries, they were able to sell it there. We're trying to export it back to, like you say, highly regulated nations. I mean, this is going to be the downfall of everybody. The high regulation in food and supplements and electrical devices and everywhere you look, there's not even a single step you can take without the most absurd amount of regulation on top of anything that could get us off of these centralized systems. So the more they talk about decentralization and autonomy and power production and food production at your local level, community level, everything else on the more national or even now what we're seeing is, you know, full international treaties what you just told me is fascinating and it just gives so much hope that there are other technologies out there to start our new world with. I mean, it, it's well, going to yeah. deconstruct first before it gets reconstructed. And I'm wondering if these devices could be a pillar of the new world. Well, every community needs one of these. You know, every community needs one because it's, uh, you know, there's a reason why nobody knows about them. There's a really, really good reason. Because you, you always talk about, you know, fresh food, clean water, air and sunshine being the pillars of health. Now, if we go grid down or we get into hyperinflationary food chains and food pricing, uh, access to fresh food is going to get, well, it'll be a little more tricky. But then the clean water also. So if we're coming to a point where people aren't going to have access to as much clean water, especially more in a city environment, you know, living out here, we have a pond and we've got wells and things. But what's the average person to do to continue to maintain their health with, you know, these access to cleaner uh, inputs as the systems for delivery start to break down? I think iodine is probably the most important thing iodine. that people could stock up, up with, because if you, unlike putting chlorine in the water, iodine will actually do you good as well as making the water safer to drink. You know, you know, there's life straws where you, you drink through a straw and it. That, as far as I understand, that's just iodine inside that's slowly, uh, you know, uh, working. So um, clearly filtering water, I mean, you know, everything can be done for almost nothing if you really had to. You know, you could get fine sands and so on. You could you make your own water filter with charcoal and sand, you know, lots of things you could do. You know, loads, loads of ways that we can get around it. I mean, one of my favorites is, let's say that you wanted a multi-mineral and you had no money at all, but you had a bucket and spade. Well, you could go into the forest, dig up some earth, get some spring water, get some muddy water together and drink it. Perfect. Everything has ever lived or died. You know, the forest floor of an old forest makes the most perfect mineral supplement because it's totally balanced. Everything that's ever lived or died, bam, is in the soil. It's incredible. Every amino acid, every everything. Are you talking about removing the leaf cover off that and digging into the dirt? Or yeah, yeah, leaf digging down. Has a leaf digging, mold on it. Yeah, take all the leaf mold off and dig right down, you know, a foot or something until you're just pure 
soil, pure humus, whatever. And, uh, you know, that would be a good mineral supplement. I'm not necessarily suggesting people do that. You know, the easy way is to have nature do it for you in the form of fulvic minerals. You know, a bottle of fulvic minerals, 50 mil, would last months. And that's where, in a few rare places in the world, uh, some geological thing happened for some reason, and there's incredible mineral concentrate in small areas. The area where, where the mine is that ours comes from is, I think, only about half a mile or something. But all you got to do is run water through this mineral-rich deposit, and you, you've got like a four-month supply in a tiny bottle. It's that powerful. Have you ever seen that great goat video where there's a dam in Europe, massive great dam, this baby goat follows its mum up like 800 feet up the dam to lick the minerals that are leaching through the dam in the water. Have you seen that one? Yeah, it's almost nigh impossible. And you're like, that's impossible for them to do that. But just the way they're sitting there, so sideways tucked in on that thing, it's yeah. just, and nature it's is them, remarkable. Yeah, and all that to get the mineral rich water. That bit of stone where they built the dam with was so full of minerals that they go 800 foot to find it. How do they even know it's there? Unless they can see in a different light spectrum, then, then there's some sort of frequency coming off those minerals. And, yeah, you know, salt, point. salt, you know, is the pillar of our, of our world. You know, they're worth their salt, you know, when you're being paid by salt. So, you know, again, in sort of a supply chain disruption here, where do salt come from? I mean, if you're not by the seaside and you're not near a salt mine and, you know, in the West, they have the Great Salt Lake. Well, obviously that's thousands of miles from where we live here. Still several hundred miles from the ocean tucked back behind a mountain range. So the average person, where are they going to find salt if it just disappears out of the supermarket? Well, funny you should ask that. Years ago, long time ago, I met this really old Nigerian woman and she said all her ancestors had lived to over a hundred. And she was only about 30 when her tribe was discovered. You know, up until then, they were sort of on their own. And they were so far inland that they didn't know that oceans or seas or salt existed. And I said to her, I thought everybody needed salt to live. And she said, well, uh, what the tribe did was at the end of each meal, they put all the waste, the food waste on the fire. And the next day when it was down to white ash, they'd take a couple of spoonfuls of ash and put it in the next meal, mix it in. So they were just always recycling the minerals to the maximum. So I mean, ash, potash, you know, it's potassium. You know, potash is great for the plants, the flowers, and for us. So it's a bit like, as I was saying with the soil, that all life is there. Minerals are not destroyed by heat. So you can burn, you can burn it to the ground and the ash is good for you. They put ash in pet foods, for example. It's not just to fill it, it's because ash is full of minerals. So let me ask you a question about dosage for the fulvic minerals. So let's say I take, you know, a pound of like some incredible virgin earth soils from up on our forest, higher up the mountain, and, you know, one pound of it, and then mixing in with the water, stirring it up and getting that slurry, and then you filter it off, obviously. And then you're talking about droppers. So we're not talking no, about no. drinking a glass of this. We're talking I am about I am talking drops. about drinking. Yeah, no, I'm talking about drinking a glass of muddy water like a dog would. The dogs love muddy puddles, don't they? They, they do, just don't love they? it. They they're and always so, so just, just just copy the copy the dog. But you don't have to drink it from the puddle. But I mean, that sort of quantity. I mean, it was full of minerals, they're so strong you only need a few drops. But if you were using muddy water, it's not going to be that strong. So you probably would have to drink a glass of muddy water. You know, it's not something I've ever seriously looked at. It's sort of no, I've never done it. It's just notional that um, many people, the, the head of the, um, uh, the organic farming um, group in England, you know, where they do all the, all the certification, it was him who told me this is, the, this is what you do if you're stuck with no money. So it comes from a good source, the idea. Okay, because looking into biochar, because we have a lot of uh, fires when we're clearing out it's the brush so, around. It, it's you know, so you, interesting that you mentioned biochar because the guy who was the head of the Soil Association, the organic people here, his current business is biochar. He started a chocolate company called Green and Black. So I don't know if you get that in the States. It's an organic ch chocolate company. And so, yeah, biochar is this big thing. Super important, isn't it? 
And I will add on to something with the peak oil from Cuba. You know, there's another, uh, you know, highly read article. It's called The Year in Hell about the war in Bosnia. When again, they, you know, everything was great with the peace talks 12 hours earlier. And then suddenly the siege is going on and everything ceases for a year and a half. And, you know, Clive, you're always talking about on the nutrition side, the most important being vitamin C, magnesium, iodine, zinc, vitamin D, especially, uh, you know, during the, the months where there's not so much sunlight, you know, more cloud cover, but, you know, taking into the same consideration here. Okay. They were warned 12 weeks out that the diesel fuel is stopping. Well, I'm unequivocally saying coming up in September and October, we're at that same crux or juncture because as we come into the harvest season and they realize what was not grown, the panic's going to ensue across the planet is the non-availability and then the hyperinflationary food prices come in and governments are going to be asking you to go to a digital rationing card with facial recognition and troops stationed in the supermarkets and across the farmlands of many parts of the world. So between now and then, there's still that sort of equivalent 12-week window to get prepared where those in Bosnia had 12 hours if they would have read through you know, the, the propaganda that was being put out, like, oh, the peace talks are great, nothing's going to happen, and whoosh, and then locked off immediately. So in time to prepare, you know, what would you suggest people would get for this sort of, uh, it's not going to last forever. I would say it'll go for a year or so, just like in COVID. Remember in the beginning, everything was scarce. There wasn't enough hand sanitizer. There weren't enough masks. There was not enough this, that, and the other. But as the demand surged, you know, we got into this ramp up of massive manufacturing of those things. And then now there's, uh, it's oversaturated and the demand is structured. They're giving stuff away at the end there just because they couldn't even sell it. Nobody wanted it. So I can see something coming economically very similar where in the beginning for at least this one year period, because of starvation or very lean food times all the way through the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, I guarantee you next spring, people are going to be on that so fast. And, you know, you've got to think about integrity, consciousness, not price consciousness when you're purchasing tools and things that could keep your bodies healthy. Don't just think about the price because there might not be, uh, like I say, longevity in that. So you're going to be thinking about integrity or companies that really want to protect you with the value and really care about the products they're putting out compared to just the price point on it and any other, any others that would be essentials to put in sort of a, 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 a bodily health kit while we have the time right now? Well, well, absolutely. I mean, clearly inflation is going to happen and the supply problems have been ridiculous the last two years. I mean, I, I can't ship to France, Germany, Portugal, Russia, a number of companies because the customs won't accept our products. Uh, so I would suggest that anybody should look on the website at the products that are available. Unfortunately, because, because we're in England, I cannot tell you anything about any of the products on my website. If I were to say, water hydrates you. If I were to put that on my website, water hydrates you, two years in prison because I haven't done a double blind clinical trial, which would be impossible with water, to prove it. That's how crazy it's got in Europe, right? I mean, it's super crazy. So I would recommend that everybody stocks up, as I say, with the ingredients you've just mentioned. I mean, very briefly, iodine makes your hormones work properly, makes your brain work properly, tends to end dry skin, it tends to fix thyroids. It balances temperature and fixes most people's menopause issues. That's iodine. If you're doing that, you want to take selenium along with it, which when you take the right type in the right dose, lots of people come off drugs, whether pharmaceutical or recreational. 30% of us are addicts because we don't get enough dopamine and we need want caffeine, drugs, sex, rock and roll, any pleasure, right? We want pleasure, which creates dopamine, checking your phone, right? What all, anything addictive is dopamine. And amino acids have the capability to fill the dopamine receptors and make you not want to be addicted. And more and more, we're, many of us are, are going towards substances or overeating or whatever it might be because we're sad and depressed and scared. You know, I'm not talking about myself or you, but a lot of people, 90% of people are 
scared and fearful and you know don't know what what the hell's going on or why so you start combining full thick minerals because if you've got a nice balance of minerals uh your body isn't so likely to crave things you take vitamin c because that detoxifies you so let me ask you about the Vitamin C powder, like Kamu Kamu vitamin C is, you know, a common one that we can find here in acerola powder also, which is, you know, they're rather high in vitamin C concentrations. Uh, what are you thinking about powders and these types of powderized fruits that are full of vitamins versus taking tablets or pills? Okay. All the research where people have recovered from life-threatening diseases, the really serious ones that they might die tomorrow, all the mega research has always been done with the synthetic vitamin C, ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate primarily. Now, let's say you're super healthy and you want to make sure you've got enough vitamin C. Acerola cherry or, as you say, camu camu, rose hips. There are a number of ways to get natural vitamin C. Uh, red peppers, for example. Peppers have got loads of vitamin C. Chilies, you know, loads of vegetables. But the problem is that if that's good for maintenance, but vitamin C deteriorates with time, with heat, you know, an orange, by the time it's ended up in your kitchen, there's probably only 20% of the vitamin C left, if, if that, if you're lucky. When it's fresh, it was all there. So, I mean, let's say you had an apple, right? Now, imagine you now dehydrated that apple into a powder. Which is going to be healthier, the apple or the powder? Well, the apple, obviously, because you've destroyed the enzymes by powdering it and so on. So while for pure health, yes, let's go for camu, camu, and acerola, cherry, whatever, you want to use it for uh, a remedy, you have to use ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate because you can't get the quantity. You, know, you can't shovel down a kilo of acerola, cherry. You know, you'd vomit. Whereas you can take a few teaspoonfuls on a regular basis of uh, vitamin C as ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate.